All right, so let's talk about the limited public service loan forgiveness waiver and increasing access to this life-changing but elusive benefit. I wanna start off by sharing with you all a success story from the limited public service loan forgiveness waiver, then talking about original public service loan forgiveness because the original rules of the program are expected to go back into effect uh, on or after October 31st of 2022. We'll also drill down on those requirements and their impact in Maryland so far, and then we'll focus on the limited PSLF waiver, next steps to apply, some informational resources, and closing thoughts. Um, I wanted to share with this group specifically the next steps to apply because many of us work for um, higher education institutions, and if you're working for a, a public institution or even many of the private institutions, your employer is an eligible organization for public service loan forgiveness. And once you know that your employer is eligible, you can take the next steps to uh, see how much you could benefit from this program. So I wanna start out with a success story. This is from a borrower who has worked for the federal government uh, since 2008. She said, I can breathe, the trees are clearing, and I have hope that my student loan debt will be a thing of the past. And this is just an email that the borrower sent me after she saw her qualifying payment count increase from 31 to 88 after applying for public service loan forgiveness through the limited waiver. Now I'm throwing out a lot of lingo already like qualifying payment counts, limited waiver, PSLF. I'm gonna walk you through um, what all of this means and hopefully help you all identify whether you can benefit from this program too but we're seeing success stories start to come in um, much more steadily now. Sorry about that. Okay, so first I wanna review the original requirements of the public service loan forgiveness program. And again, it's important to understand these because these are the requirements that we expect to go back into effect once the waiver expires on October 31st of this year. The first requirement is that a borrower has to make 100 qualifying payments. Those payments have to be made monthly, so this requires a minimum 10-year commitment to achieve loan cancellation through this program. Those payments also must be made on direct loans only. Uh, third is that the payments have to be made while the borrower is enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan. The fourth requirement is that the borrower has to work for a qualifying employer for the entire time that those qualifying payments were made on direct loans while the borrower was enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan. The fifth and final requirement is that the borrower needs to remain working for a qualifying employer at the time that they apply for and receive public service loan forgiveness. And this uh, image is provided by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid. I want to drill down on each of these requirements one by one. The first one is qualifying payments. In order to receive public service loan forgiveness, you have to have made under the original rules, a minimum of 120 monthly payments. The only payments that count are those that have been made after October 1st of 2007. The payments also must be made on time and in full. The question that I'm commonly asked is, what if I make multiple partial payments? Can I speed this up? The answer is no. You're looking at a minimum 120 month commitment. If you make multiple partial payments, those payments will count as one payment for the corresponding month. All payments must be received within 15 days of the due date to be considered on time. Uh, one other thing that people ask a lot is, do I have to make the payments straight through? Do they need to be consecutive? And the answer is no. Public service loan forgiveness is achievable faster if the payments are consecutive, but making the payments consecutively is not a requirement. And also extra payments do not qualify. So there's really nothing that you can do from the payment side to speed up the process. A benefit that many borrowers have is through the CARES Act forbearance. And as long as you've had qualifying employment during that CARES Act forbearance, the months, even the months when you were required to make zero payments will count toward the 120 monthly payments necessary for public service loan forgiveness. So those of you that work for institutions of higher education that are qualifying employers, yes, you will get credit for that time as long as the employment was intact. The second requirement is that the payments have to be made on qualifying loans. Loans that qualify under the original rules of public service loan forgiveness are direct loans. And there's several varieties of direct loans. They're listed here. The direct subsidized loan, direct unsubsidized loan, direct plus loan for graduate and professional students, 
direct parent plus loans, as well as direct consolidation loans. Parent plus loans are treated a bit differently. So if you're a parent plus loan borrower and you would have liked to get your parent plus loans on track for public service loan forgiveness, then you'd have to consolidate those loans into a direct consolidation loan. And then make sure that you're enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan. And the next slide that we're gonna take a look at gives you the requirements. Uh, number three, what is a qualifying repayment plan? So for those of you that have been in repayment, you know that there are many repayment options made available to federal student loan borrowers, but not all of them qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Under the original rules, these are the repayment plans that qualify. The 10-year standard plan, the income-based repayment plan, the income contingent repayment plan, pay as you earn, revised pay as you earn, and there's a provision for other plans for which the monthly payment is greater than the 10-year standard plan payment. I haven't seen that happen too often, but just wanted to share that with you um, on the off chance that that situation might apply to you. Generally speaking, income-driven plans are the ones that are most likely to yield a balance for forgiveness. For example, if you pay under the 10-year standard plan, if you make all of your payments on time in full, you won't have a balance left to forgive at the end of 10 years. But there's some situations where a person might have started with an income-based repayment plan and then transitioned to a standard plan, those payments could still count even if they're enrolled in the standard plan. But if you start on standard and finish on standard, there's nothing left for you to benefit from a public service loan forgiveness under the original rules. Quick note again about Parent PLUS loans. The only income-driven repayment plan currently available to Parent PLUS borrowers is the income contingent repayment plan. So if you're a Parent PLUS borrower, you would need to consolidate your loans into a direct consolidation loan, and then enroll in the income contingent repayment plan to make sure that you're on track for public service loan forgiveness. So let's move to requirement number four, which is qualifying employment. The point I would like for everyone to remember is that the entity you work for matters more than what you do. Public service loan forgiveness is not about your particular job or your job duties. It's about the type of organization that you work for. So if you work for the government, whether that's federal, uh, state, local, or even a tribal agency, a uh, government uh, is a qualifying employer. If you work for 501c3 uh, nonprofit organizations, those are qualifying employers. There are also other not-for-profit organizations that provide qualifying services, and they're only um, there are a, a few activities that do not qualify, such as partisan political organizations and working for uh, labor unions. But generally speaking, government, 501c3 nonprofit organizations, and others that provide qualifying services are qualifying employers for the purposes of PSLF. Now, PSLF also requires full-time employment. And the definition of full-time for the program is your employer's definition of full-time or 30 hours per week whichever is greater. So keep in mind, you need to be uh, uh, considered full-time based on your employer's definition or uh, meeting the requirement of an average of 30 hours worked per week. For many people in the higher ed space who are teaching in more than one institution, this question comes up. What if I have multiple part-time jobs? You can work for multiple um, qualifying employers and those part-time jobs can be combined. And if you have enough hours, the combination of those part-time positions can be considered as meeting the full-time threshold for the purposes of public service loan forgiveness. I'd like to give a quick note here about a rule that went into effect July 1st of 2021. And that has to do with hours spent in religious instruction, worship services or proselytizing as a part of job responsibilities. Prior to July 1st of 2021, time spent in those activities was not considered as qualifying employment for public service loan forgiveness. So in theory, a person would have to look at the time they spent on those activities versus the time they spent on other qualifying services to figure out, do they meet that full-time threshold? But as of July 1st, 2021, that rule no longer applies. So the hours spent in those activities, as long as they're part of the job responsibilities for a person working for a nonprofit organization can count toward PSLF. The fifth and final requirement is about qualifying employment and timing. Borrowers must work in public service, in a public service career at the time that their PSLF application is received, 
um, is submitted and also with the time that loan forgiveness is received. So this is one of those requirements that really, um, it, it penalized people who might have retired or who shifted from uh, a not-for-profit career to the for-profit space or dropped from full-time to part-time because they were not working in qualifying employment at the time that they submitted their application. So we've got the five requirements. For all of those five requirements to work for 120 months, it takes a lot. And so I don't know if you all have heard, but the original public service loan forgiveness program had a rejection rate around 97 to 98%. Uh, the rejection rate was similarly high for temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness. But on October 6th of last year, the Department of Education announced the limited public service loan forgiveness waiver and things have definitely changed. Let's look at how many people were accepted to, uh, for public service loan forgiveness prior to the waiver. Between really November of 2017 and October of 2021, about 16,000 borrowers saw their remaining balances cleared as a result of satisfying the requirements of public service loan forgiveness. Between no November really of 2021 and June of 2022, that number has increased to 165,000 borrowers. So we have seen a tenfold increase in a matter of months compared to the number of borrowers that were approved for the program between late 2017 and late 2021. And that difference can be directly attributed to the provisions of the limited public service loan forgiveness waiver. So if there's nothing else that you take away from this presentation, let this be the slide that you take a screenshot of. This gives you the requirements of the original public service loan forgiveness program, as well as the temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness program and the limited public service loan forgiveness waiver. So if we look at original PSLF, those five requirements again, you've got 120 monthly payments that can be made on direct loans only while enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan, while working for a qualifying employer for the entire 120 months, as well as when you apply for and receive public service loan forgiveness. If you look at the middle column, this is where you'll see the provisions of temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness. You'll notice that just one requirement was removed, and that was the requirement that the borrower had to be enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan. Fast forward to the limited waiver on the right you'll see that now there are two requirements left. The first, it's not 120 monthly payments, it's 120 periods of repayment. So the department has shifted away from looking at actual payments to looking at the loan status history for your loans to determine periods of repayment or months when your loan was in an acceptable status. The other remaining requirement is that during those 120 periods of repayment, you'll uh, need to have had work experience for a qualifying employer. So you can see just looking at those columns, the big difference that the limited waiver has made. We've gone basically from five requirements down to two. And as a result, we've seen that uh, number of borrowers approved um, go up tenfold. I wanna pause for just a moment here to say, 120 is not the only success that can be achieved through the waiver. Of course, 120 is basically the magic number. That's the goal that we all wanna to get to because then we can have the remaining balances of our debt cleared. However, this waiver is an opportunity for people who have less than 120 months of either repayment history or employment history to gain credit for months that might've been deemed ineligible before. So if you've only had six or seven years of work experience for a qualifying employer, don't take this as uh, meaning that you should not apply through the waiver because you don't have enough repayment history or employment history. What this means is that in the history you have, there could be periods of repayment that were not eligible before, but you need to apply before October 31st of this year to get credit for every one of those periods of repayment possible. So 120, again, that's the prize. That's the goal we have in mind. But please, if you have less than that amount of history, I still would like for you to consider applying through the waiver so that you can get as close to 120 as possible based on the amount of experience you have already. The limited waiver is temporary and as of right now, it's set to expire on October 31st of 2022. So as a refresher, um, how the original form of PSLF, sometimes they refer to it as PSLF basic, compares to the limited PSLF waiver, under these new rules, any prior payment made will count as a qualifying payment, regardless of the loan type, the repayment plan, 
or whether the payment was made in full or in time, or in some cases, whether the payment was made at all. This change will apply to student loan borrowers with direct loans, those who have already consolidated into the direct loan program, and those who consolidate into the direct loan program by October 31st of 2022. Since the waiver was announced in October of 2021, we've received more guidance on um, different periods that will qualify. And we've been informed that certain forbearances as well as deferments before 2013 will qualify as well. But the key is you have to have that qualifying employment for uh, this time in forbearance or certain types of deferment uh, to qualify. Unfortunately, parent plus loans alone are not eligible to receive any additional credit under the limited PSLF waiver. But if you are a person who has borrowed parent plus loans for your child and you have student loans remaining for yourself, then the waiver does make a way for the parent plus loans to be addressed. But if all you have is parent plus loans, unfortunately, the waiver does not provide any additional um, assistance. So I wanted to talk to you about the impact of the waiver in Maryland. And I'm sharing with you an email that I received from a person who attended uh, one of our PSLF events uh, at the Anne Arundel um, County Public Library in Edgewater. And the subject line is, hopefully there's hope. The person wrote, I attended the session at Ed Edgewater Library on Wednesday and mentioned how I did not qualify for the teacher loan forgiveness program. Under PSLF, I qualified for an income contingent repayment plan. And based on the calculations, the agent told me I would ultimately end up paying off my loan. I'm hoping there is hope for me with the new waiver. Now, this is the email that I received after the event. I can tell you from meeting this person at the event, um, the, the hopelessness, the, that sense of hopelessness was palpable and it was just sad to witness. So I was delighted to reach back out to this person who is a teacher in Prince George's County Public Schools, which is where I graduated from. I was able to reach out to her. We connected the next day and we took a look together at uh, her account. And we found that she unknowingly had 134 eligible payments on record. So she had more than enough payments to satisfy the 120 mark, but there's something that you have to do to get the payments to be converted from eligible to qualifying. And that is to certify your employment because public service employment is what this is all about. Without the employment, you will get no credit for those past payments. So this borrower had 134 eligible payments. 45 of those payments had been recognized as qualifying towards PSLF. So that means that of the 134, we really need 120. Of the 120, 45 had been um, identified as counting toward PSLF. The other 89 payments will be approved upon certification of employment. This person has worked for Prince George's County Public Schools for the past 17 years. So what's standing between her and $25,000 worth of debt being canceled is one application, and that is the Public Service Loan Forgiveness application. So um, it's happening, the waiver is working, uh, and I just wanted to share with you that for Maryland, this has been such an enormous relief to date. $320 million worth of federal student loan debt has been canceled for 4,700 Marylanders who have met the requirements of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. And these figures are from the Office of Federal Student Aid as of the end of June, 2022. I believe there is so much more ground to cover and uh, we are working hard to cover that ground and bring as many Marylanders into the pipeline as possible. So, what we're doing is we've launched a campaign called Maryland Telepublic Servant. Uh, the campaign in short is MDTAPS. We wanna spread the word using social media with that hashtag MDTAPS so that people know about the existence of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program as well as the time sensitive nature of the limited PSLF waiver. So this campaign is designed to spread awareness about this time sensitive opportunity that can bring and has brought public servants closer to realizing that magic number 120 and having their federal student loan forgiven. Um, if you're looking for information to share, or if you are a public servant, I encourage you to please visit studentaid.gov PSLF because ultimately the Department of Education is the number one source 
of information about public service loan forgiveness and federal student loans. I'd also urge you to visit the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness online. We are at mccfw.org, and we have set up an online resource page dedicated to public service loan forgiveness and the limited PSLF waiver. If you visit our website, just click on MD Taps. You'll find information there. You'll find resources. You'll also find links to our videos that provide answers to frequently asked questions um, that um, have been annotated so that you can get straight to the content that matters most to you. And I encourage you, if you are a public, service, public servant with student loans, please consider applying through the waiver and also sharing this information with your colleagues because the relief that has been provided through this program as well as the waiver has been truly life-changing. Next, I'd like to talk to you a bit about what you can do next to take advantage of this program. As I've mentioned before, it's a time-sensitive opportunity for borrowers who work or have worked directly for qualifying employers after October 1st of 2007. There are four steps. The first step is to confirm your employer eligibility because this is the public service loan forgiveness program. Without the public service, there is no loan forgiveness. So you wanna confirm that your employer is eligible. You can do that by obtaining the employer identification number from your W-2 for all of your employers that you've worked for since October 1st of 2007. And you can visit studentaid.gov slash PSLF to search the database of eligible employers. After you've confirmed your eligibility, the next thing you'll need to do, to do is to verify your loan types because different um, types of loans will require a different set of action. You can verify your loan types again by visiting studentaid.gov, logging in. When you view um, your loans, you'll see your portfolio when you first log in on the summary, but you wanna drill down all the way to the detail and look at the loan types. The loan type will tell you the full name of your loan and that full name is gonna uh, determine whether you need to consolidate. So let's move to the next step, which is decision point, whether to consolidate. If you have non-direct loans, those loans must be consolidated in order for them to be considered for relief through the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. If your loans are direct, then you don't need to consolidate. But if you have loans that are on um, that were borrowed at different times, or are currently on different repayment clocks, you might want to consolidate to get them all on the same clock for the purposes of um, receiving relief through public service loan forgiveness. But step three is that decision point. If you have the older variety of loans, such as uh, FFEL loans, those loans don't qualify for public service loan forgiveness unless they're consolidated into the direct loan program. So when you view your loan types in studentaid.gov, I want you to look out for the word direct. If the loan is direct, then you don't have to consolidate. Um, you might find it advantageous to do so, but it's not a necessity to get through public service loan forgiveness. If you have the older variety of loans, then uh, consolidation would be required for those loans to be considered for PSLF. The last thing you need to do is to certify your employment. I highly recommend using the PSLF help tool um, you can download the paper application at studentaid.gov slash PSLF, but I would encourage you to use the PSLF help tool instead so that you don't have to worry about issues of um, your handwriting being illegible or checking the wrong box and having your application denied on a technicality. So please use the PSLF help tool to answer a few questions, populate that form, and then submit the application by October 31st of 2022. Now today, I've just given you a crash course in um, PSLF and this limited PSLF waiver. But one great thing that we have engaged in at the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness is, um, of course, providing the online resource page, but also providing an event called Office Hours, where people can hop in and ask questions about student loan repayment. And of course, the number one topic since we launched Office Hours in December has been public service loan forgiveness. Uh, we have an addition coming up tomorrow night. So if you have specific questions, I encourage you to join us for office hours and we'll walk you through everything. Um, I'd also like to share with you some other informational resources for borrowers. Again, the number one source is studentaid.gov, the Office of Federal Student Aid for all of your questions uh, for matters related to federal student loans. Online, you can confirm your employer's eligibility. You can verify your loan types. You can access the Public Service Loan Forgiveness application and the help tool. 
You can also complete the application to consolidate. So everything you need to do, you can find online at studentaid.gov. I also would like to reshare our online resource page uh, for Maryland Teller Public Service Loan Forgiveness, a teller public servant, excuse me, about public service loan forgiveness, and that's at mccfw.org slash mdtaps. If you are interested in the real-time experiences of borrowers who are pursuing public service loan forgiveness, I would encourage you to visit the Reddit PSLF mega thread. You will find people that are sharing the journey as uh, they go. And because there's so many moving parts of this, um, like the service or transition, it's very helpful to hear what other people are going through in real time. So um, check out Reddit, visit that PSLF mega thread for details. I'd also like to recommend the Student Borrower Protection Center. They have a great website, forgivemystudentdebt.org, that also has steps to walk you through the process of applying for public service loan forgiveness through the limited waiver. So to wrap things up um, on the limited waiver, I just want to focus on two groups. One is for borrowers. The key needs here are awareness and action. We need to spread the word. So I'm hopeful that many of you will visit uh, the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness online. Check out our MD Taps page, share it with a colleague, and apply for public service loan forgiveness yourself if you feel you meet the requirements. The waiver is set to expire on October 31st of 2022, so we have a lot of work to do to spread the word and to get people in the pipeline. What I found is that I can talk about the waiver until I'm blue in the face, but the success stories are really what makes a difference. <laughs> people want to hear about how the waiver has worked for others, so if you've achieved some success in increased payment count or actually having your debt forgiven, please do share those stories with us so that we can circulate them out to members of our community and hopefully propel others to apply for the waiver and spread the word. From the perspective of an employer, I think it's important for us to take a look at roles and processes. Employment verification is a required part of the application process. So if you are an employer, you work in um, HR benefits, it's good for you to know the type of organization um, you work for. And I know that sounds funny. People say, how could you not know the type of organization you work for? When I say type, I mean whether the organization qualifies for public service loan forgiveness, whether your organization is a 501c3 or perhaps it's a 501c4, that makes a difference. So as an employer, you need to be clear about the type of organization that you work for before you begin to process um, borrowers' applications. Most higher education institutions are qualifying employers for public service loan forgiveness. So there are many people in our network of campus-based professionals who we believe can and will benefit from public service loan forgiveness and the waiver. If you are an employer, you can help your employees by making a clear statement about who the authorized officials are on campus who can actually sign the form so that your employees know where to go when they'd like to complete their application. It's also helpful to establish a process for who is gonna complete the forms, what the time frame is for returning those forms, or if the employer will send the form to the servicer on behalf of the employee. Some employers have decided to do that, but in order for this to run smoothly, just start with confirming that your employer, your organization is eligible, identifying who's authorized to sign off on the applications, and then establishing a process and communicating that process to employees so that they can get their applications in with confidence, knowing that they'll be able to apply through the waiver before October 31st of 2022. For my higher ed colleagues, I have to say that when the waiver first came out, my mind just went racing. I was thinking, we can do this with alumni, we can do this with staff, we can start with the financial aid office. But as you all have heard today, our financial aid offices and other campus-based professionals have been swamped with other duties and also dealing with staffing challenges. So the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program and the limited uh, PSLF waiver has not necessarily been um, a, a wide-scale priority. I'm hopeful that what you've heard today will spark you to think about what you can do on your campus or your or within your organization to spread the word about the waiver and make sure that as many Marylanders are able to take advantage of this benefit as possible. So I'm thinking about employees still providing relief and even um, using this as an incentive for people to come into higher education and to stay, but also for alumni relief. Imagine if a graduate can come back and say, someone from my school told me about this program that helped me have 
$50,000 worth of debt forgiven. I think you will find an engaged alumni <laughs> um, after sharing a resource like that. So there are plenty of things that we can do with this. There are several programs that we have coming up with our partners in higher ed to make the final push as we enter the last three months of availability uh, for the limited PSLF waiver. So if you have questions for yourself or for your institution, I'd encourage you to take part in our free virtual student loan clinic office hours. We'll host one tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. You can register online at mccfw.org slash events, or you can join us on Facebook Live and just pop in, leave comments, and we'll take questions all throughout. So I know that that was a lot of information about the limited PSLF waiver, but I wanted to make sure that everyone who was here had the opportunity to hear about the waiver and hopefully apply for it if you have that eligible employment and loan balances remaining. At this time, I would like to shift to um, closing out today's symposium. And I don't know about you, but it feels like today just flew by <laughs> for me. Uh, last summer, um, when we launched NICFU with the symposium, who could have known how the financial landscape for um, the nation college and career students would have changed in such a short period of time. I have to say um, that in this one year, we have seen so much and we have done our best to respond to, the, to meet the needs of our community as best as possible, given the resources that we had available. And sometimes um, there's so much need that we tend to focus on what's left to do instead of taking a moment to celebrate all that has been done. In fact, uh, last week I was meeting with a new community partner and um, she was telling me about how passionate she was about mountain climbing, not just for the moment when she reaches the peak, but just stepping back, just pausing at various parts in the journey to turn around and look at the view from a different vantage point. So it's important for all of us, financial aid professionals, everyone who's involved in this financial education and wellness journey to take a pause sometimes not think so much about all the ground we have left to cover, but to look back and celebrate the achievements that have happened thus far. So I encourage you to take a moment, like Dr. Vincent said, show grace, give that grace to yourself. Take a moment, look back and celebrate all of those achievements and the things that you have accomplished thus far. We've heard just the sampling of the challenges that are faced by our campus-based professionals and community members. And I would like for us all to just take a moment to celebrate that we've made it through, celebrate all the milestones on this journey of adapting to unforeseen circumstances and still advancing collegiate financial wellness. At McFew, we have much to celebrate. And I just wanna share with you before I go, um, a glimpse of my view looking back at the climb this past year. And I wanna do this with numbers. So I'll start with the number six. There's six pillars of collegiate financial wellness identified in a vision for all of Maryland's college and career students. 13 is the number of virtual student loan clinics that we have hosted for free to help Marylanders navigate student loan repayment and prepare for financial success beyond it. 44 is the number of campus-based professionals and community partners who attended our first statewide network meeting last fall to share information and explore timely issues related to financial wellness. 100 plus, that's the number of individual borrowers I've personally interacted with about their prospects and applications for public service loan forgiveness through the limited waiver. Six million, six million dollars is the minimum amount of collective federal student loan debt for those borrowers who are hopeful and now in the pipeline applying for public service loan forgiveness. Lastly is countless. This is the number of lives impacted for the better because of the support that McFew has provided through events, coaching, contact creation, content creation, and responses to queries about post-secondary education and finances. Believe me when I tell you there is so much more to come, but for right now, I wanna thank each and every one of you for being present with me in this moment right now to celebrate the climb. Of course, this type of impact is not possible without support from an awesome team. So I would like to thank all of our speakers today. And I'd also like to thank the Cash Campaign of Maryland for serving as the fiscal sponsor of McFew. Again, thank the T. Rowe Price Foundation for their generous support, um, investing in McFew, helping to make today's event possible, the Woodside Foundation for their support as well as strategic advice along the way, 
the University System of Maryland. Um, also, Mikua and Angela Sherman, I saw you today, and I thank you so much for your support. And I'd also like to thank the team at Adeo Advocacy for producing today's event. Last but certainly not least, I have to thank my family, um, my husband, Michael, my children, Lauren and Mikey, for teaching me so many lessons. But I'd also like to pause and thank my father, Ezel Silver Jr., for his constant support and willingness to invest in me and my dreams. On behalf of Team McHugh, I thank you so much for joining us today for our second annual virtual symposium. I hope that what you've heard today will stay with you as you work in your various organizations and institutions to advance the cause of collegiate financial wellness. Until next time, be well.